so good evening everybody thanks again for joining us this evening um it's great to have you here and we're really looking forward uh to sharing more about the world of riverfly with you this evening so my name is steph and i am the events officer for the unlocking the seven project so this event is brought to you by unlocking the seven which is a conservation and river engagement project that is all about people and wildlife so unlocking the seven if you don't know much about us, it's providing fish passage at six barriers on the River Severn and its tributary, the River Team. Um, and this will restore 158 miles of river habitat and benefit a whole host of important fish species, such as the Twait Shad. And the project also includes a really exciting range of activities for people of all ages, interests and backgrounds so that more people can learn from and be inspired by the UK's longest river. Um, the project is being delivered by the partners that you can see at the bottom of my screen, Canal and River Trust, Seven Rivers Trust, the Environment Agency and Natural England. And it's all made possible thanks to funding from the National Lottery Heritage Fund, and the EU Life Programme. So I was just pausing after each one there, as you can see, we're joined on screen by Laura, who is a British Sign Language interpreter, who had to spell out all of those names for us. And Laura will be present throughout. And please be mindful that this is a live, um, a live talk with live interpretation and is not a direct translation. So just a few pieces of housekeeping before we get started with tonight's talk. Um, this webinar is being recorded and will hopefully be accessible on our YouTube channel afterwards. It will last up to an hour, so there'll be a presentation followed by um, time for questions. So if you would like to ask a question for our speaker, um, you can do so through the Q&A box, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen in the control panel. So any questions um, for Rachel can be directed to there. As I mentioned, we also have the chat function, so feel free to, to type in there. I'll be on hand to answer any technical questions you might have. Um, so please do feel free to say hello in there if you'd like to, and ensure that you're, you select to send messages to all attendees. So during screen sharing this evening, you should be able to see the presentation on one side of your screen and the speakers on the right hand side. If this isn't the case for you and you would like to make use of British Sign Language, um, please follow the following instructions. So you'll need to click on the View Options button, which you should find at the top centre of your screen, and then click on Side by Side Mode option in the drop down menu, and you'll see a tick there once that has been selected. And in a moment, I'll also paste those instructions into the chat box for you for your reference. So I'm now going to pass over to our speaker this evening, Rachel Davies, who is the volunteer officer for Unlocking the Seven. And she's going to introduce us to the wonderful world of Riverfly and explain what it can tell us about the health of our rivers. So I'm just going to stop sharing my screen and pass over to Rachel. Thanks, Rachel. Perfect. Thanks, Steph. Um, I'll just share my screen with you all. Just give me a minute. There we go. Hopefully you can um, see that now. Is that OK, Steph? Yeah, we can. Thanks, Rachel. Perfect. Um, so as, said, as Steph said, I'm Rachel and I'm the volunteering officer for Unlocking the Seven. Um, as part of the project, we do lots of river fly survey work with uh, citizen scientists throughout the seven catchment. And I'm going to tell you a little bit today about why we use river flies to talk about the health of rivers and how you can get involved. So before I begin, I just wanted to briefly mention the Riverfly Partnership. Um, so the Riverfly Partnership run the Anglers Riverfly Monitoring Initiative, which is shortened to the Army Scheme. So this is a scheme to measure water quality through Riverfly sampling. And it's this scheme that I have based this talk on, as this is what we widely use with our volunteers. So let's start by talking about what river flies are. So river flies refers to three main insect groups, 
the mayflies, the stoneflies and the caddisflies. The army scheme also includes freshwater shrimp, so I'm going to um, group those in with the river flies and talk about them tonight. So freshwater inverts provide free important ecosystem services. So firstly, they help to keep water clean by feeding on organic matter within the water. They form the basis of many food chains. And most importantly for tonight, they act as water quality indicators. And it's really this third um, service that we're focusing on. So river flies have a set of characteristics that help make them these important water quality indicators. And this is that they have limited mobility, so they don't tend to travel very far within river systems. Compared to other invertebrates, they have a relatively long life cycle. They're generally present throughout the year and they have very specific tolerances to any changes in environmental conditions. Riverfly populations tend to be affected by many factors, predominantly water quality, but they're also um, fairly impacted by habitat diversity, water level and changes in flow rate. So these characteristics, along with these factors that can affect them, make them really good water quality indicators. And because of this, they're known as the canary of our rivers. In the army scheme, eight target groups are looked at. So this is the mayflies, the stoneflies, the caddisflies and the shrimp. And these groups were chosen because partly because of their distribution. So they're widely found in all of the UK rivers. Um, they're also typically found year round. This does vary slightly on species, but generally they have a year round presence. They are insect groups that we tend to be familiar with or more familiar with than others. And with a little bit of training, they can be incredibly easy to ID, which is perfect for a citizen science scheme. So these are the river flies that I am talking about. So if we go from left to right, on the left, you can see the stonefly larvae. And these count as one group on the river fly scheme. Next, we have the mayfly larvae, and these get separated out into four different groups, which are the mayfly, the flat bodied stone clingers, the olives, and the blue winged olives. And um, the next groups are the caddisfly groups, and these are split into two the cased caddisfly, which is pictured, and the caseless caddisfly. And then our last group, the eighth group, is the freshwater shrimp. So I'll now go into talking about each group in more detail. So stoneflies are first up, and in the UK, we have 34 species. They have a relatively simple life cycle. So they start out as eggs, these hatch out into nymphs, these nymphs grow and eventually um, emerge into adults. So the nymphs uh, tend to molt multiple times. In stoneflies, it can be anywhere between 10 to 30 time, 35 times, depending on the species. And the nymph ID is relatively straightforward. So we've got one pictured on this slide. And as you can see, like all insects, it has three pairs of legs. As a nymph stage of a flying insect, you can see that it has uh, wing buds present so that you can just see them on the top of the thorax there. And then uh, the main features we use to identify stonefly are the two tails at the back of the abdomen and the two long antenna on the head. And um, so you can see when you look at the image that it's got a similar appearance on the back and the front with the two antenna and the two tails. So that is um, a really good indication it is a stonefly. Another really cool feature of these insects is that they have external gills underneath their legs on their thorax. And if you look really closely at the image, you can just make out the white hairs and it kind of gives them the impression of having hairy armpits. And that's a really good feature for picking out stoneflies. Um, so when uh, stoneflies become adults, some species do feed in their adult state. 
and they live longer in this adult state compared to uh, mayflies, for example. The adults have a very, very similar appearance to the nymphs, but they have wings um, and they tend to hold their wings quite flattened and curved around the body. Um, so they're quite a distinctive uh, river fly. Brilliant. So let's move on to the mayflies. So in the UK, we have 52 species of mayfly. Um, and these have a slightly more complex life cycle compared to a stonefly. So they start out at eggs. These eggs hatch into a nymph. These nymphs um, molt multiple times, up to 50 for some species of mayfly. And then these nymphs um, emerge into something called a sub imagio. And this is basically a sub adult stage. Um, between 24 to 48 hours after they've emerged as this sub-adult, they then emerge a further time into an adult. And we call this final adult stage an imagio stage. So the nymph ID on mayflies is really um, simple again, which is fantastic. So all mayfly larvae have free tails. And they also have external gills down the abdomen. And this is a really distinguishable feature. Um, also, like um, other insects, they have the three pairs of legs. And as they um, emerge into a flying insect, they have the wing buds present. So um, just briefly, mayfly adults uh, do not feed. And most UK species only live for a very short time in this part of the life cycle. There are a few different families, and if you want to get into adult ID, you can narrow it down by counting the number of tails. So as adults, some families will have two tails and some families will have three. And when you're looking at adults, a little tip is that a full adult, so an imagio adult wing will be transparent, whereas a sub imagio or a sub adult, their wings will be coloured. So if you see an adult with coloured wings, you know it hasn't gone through that final emergence yet. Um, let's just head back to the mayfly larvae. So as I said, for the army scheme, we split the mayfly larvae into four distinct groups. The mayfly, the flat-bodied stone clinger, the olive and the blue-winged olive. So I'll just briefly go through how we can uh, distinguish these from each other. So for the mayfly group, I think if you, when you look at the slide, you can instantly see they're different. They're a really chunky um, insect. They've got really feathery gills on their abdomen and they've got really chunky legs. If you look at the face, they've all, also got quite a distinguishable face compared to the other mayflies groups. Um, if we look at the flat bodied stone clinger, which is the best name for an insect, um, you can see that it's, uh, it's quite flat, so they have a flattened body and flattened legs, as the name would suggest, and they also have quite a broad head. If you look at the abdomen, you can see they have got quite large gills and they're certainly not feathery like they are in the mayfly group. Uh, moving on to the olive, I think again this is quite um, you can visibly see quite a difference from the other groups. It's quite a dainty, uh, delicate looking mayfly, I think. So these have um, really rounded gills on the abdomen and they're almost leaf-like and they have quite um, distinctive veination. So they do look like little leaves all the way along the abdomen. And that's a really good feature for distinguishing them. Um, and then if we move on to the blue winged olives, um, they are quite similar to the olives, but the external gills are different again. They're quite feathery again. Um, and they also have a really great feature, which is the dark rings on the tails and legs that really helps to separate them out from the other groups. Okay, moving on to caddis flies. Caddis flies are a fantastic group. So we've got over 200 species in the UK. And um, we're back to quite a simple life cycle with caddis flies. So they start out as eggs, hatch out into larvae. These larvae grow and um, eventually uh, the larvae pupate and turn into pupa. Um, and then after a short while, these pupa emerge into adults. 
we've got two groups of caddis flies on the army scheme. We've got the caseless caddis and the cased caddis. And um, these are really easy to tell apart because one is a larvae that is just bare and you can see all its appendages and its head and its body. And um, the other group, the cased group, they have a case that they've made. So really distinguishable. Um, caseless caddis flies, let's look at them first. So these can sometimes be confused with beetle or fly larvae because of their shape. But it's worth noting that fly larvae do not have the three pairs of jointed legs and beetle larvae won't have those hooked appendages on the posterior. So you can just see these posterior appendages, they've all got hooks and a fly larvae, uh, beetle larvae wouldn't have those. Um, if we move to the cased caddis fly now, these are incredibly distinctive and there's not there's nothing else like them in our UK rivers. Um, they are a fascinating group and we could probably talk a lot more about them because it's just endless interest. Um, but what I would say is that the different for the army scheme, we only need to know case caddis. Um, but on this picture, you can see there's many different types of case and that is going further than we need to. But basically different families of caddis fly choose to make cases out of uh, different materials. Um, so adult caddis flies are very similar in appearance to moths. And um, when uh, people begin moth trapping, they often confuse caddis flies for moths. Um, but a little tip is that moths have scales on their wings, whereas caddis flies have um, hairs on their wings. So if you've got a hand lens, that's really obvious to pick out. And caddis fly also sit with their antenna pointed forwards. And that's quite a distinctive, a distinctive way to sit. Um, so adult caddis flies feed and they can typically live as an adult for quite a long time compared to our other river flies. And if you do want to get into adult ID, then um, you need to be looking at the mouth parts and the spines on the legs. And um, so some technical stuff. Um, so the last group is our freshwater shrimp. So this is the eighth group on the army scheme. Uh, we've only got two species in the UK and one is confined to Scottish locks. So you can pretty much uh, be certain that you're looking at a gamorous shrimp when you're doing your surveys. Um, they have a really simple life cycle again. So they start out as eggs, hatch out into juveniles, these juveniles grow and then eventually uh, they become adult. The ID on a gamorous shrimp is again really straightforward. There's not much that looks similar. They have a curved flattened body. Um, you wouldn't be able to count them easily, but they do have seven pairs of legs and two pairs of antenna. But basically they're just curved with lots of appendages coming off one side. And a great way to ID them is that when they're swimming, they swim on their side. So they swim side on and there's nothing else really that's going to do that. So they're, they're a really easy one. They're a great one for beginners. So when it comes to surveying river flies, um, you might be tempted to look for adults. So if you did want to look for adults, you could uh, use a sweep net and sweep through vegetation and see if you can catch them. You can also try uh, laying a sheet underneath vegetation and beating the vegetation and if they're resting they'll drop off. Um, as I mentioned caddis flies are often caught in a light trap and some species of stonefly are also attracted to light. Um, another method that isn't really favourable is a malaise trap. A malaise trap is a, uh, a killing trap so unfortunately, when you're using these, you do get lots of bycatch. Um, so other methods tend to be favoured. And for adult riverfly records, all records get submitted to iRecord and then they get sent on to the relevant uh, riverfly recording scheme. But when we talk about surveying riverflies, we talk about surveying the uh, larval stage. And that is what the army scheme is all about. It's about looking at the larvae. Um, so the main method for surveying riddle, river flies is kick sampling. It's the most commonly used method, I'd say, um, and it's generally favoured over adult surveys. Um, it allows you to collect invertebrates from the substrate of the riverbed, from marginal vegetation and from in-river plants. Um, occasionally you might get some bycatch, so sometimes you get a fish or a crayfish in there, which is always nice to see. Um, but 
there's no risk to the uh, invertebrates from the survey method. So uh, you can just release them. That's not a problem. And in this picture, you can see um, some of our citizen scientists looking at a sample next to the river. So I'll just uh, briefly tell you a little bit more about kick sampling. Um, so on this picture, we have got somebody in the river who is ready to take a kick sample. And you basically, you wade in, you pop your net flat onto the riverbed and the fabric of the net should be flowing downstream so the water's flowing into it and anything in the water can be caught. Once you've got your net in position, you stand above it and you patter your feet on the substrate, kicking it so that it disturbs all of the, the riverbed and anything within it flows into your net. Once you've completed the kick part of the survey, you then can spend up to one minute washing stones. And that is basically picking up stones off the riverbed and just washing them into the net and any insects that are clinging onto them will fall off into your net. Um, and lastly, you can also um, gently sweep the net through any in-river or marginal vegetation. And by surveying these three different areas, uh, you'll collect all the different inverts that might be in that patch of the river. So if I go back to the Riverfly Partnership, um, so the Riverfly Partnership is hosted by the Freshwater Biological Association, and it is um, a network of organisations that have come together to protect our water quality in our rivers. Um, within doing this, we also further our understanding of riverfly populations and we can actively conserve riverfly habitats. And um, they've got a fantastic website that you can go on to for more information. And um, we work quite closely with them at Seven Rivers Trust and through the Unlocking the Seven project. So I'm gonna tell you now about the different types of riverfly survey you can get involved with as a volunteer. So the first survey that the partnership devised was the army scheme. And this was the, uh, the first survey that they'd come up with that people could easily do after some very basic training. So it's a simple standardized monitoring technique and it allows us to use river flies to monitor the health of our watercourses. Um, and it means that we can detect severe changes in river water quality quite easily through this method. And the great thing about this is that if we didn't have volunteers going out looking at river flies, we'd often miss these changes in river water quality. And by having volunteers going out and collecting these surveys and these samples, it allows us to monitor it more regularly, but also through the Riverfly Partnership, volunteers can be put in touch with their local ecological contact and actually report the pollution event or any severe changes that they've seen, which means that things um, get actioned more quickly. So the army scheme um, is typically done between spring, summer and autumn. Water levels can tend to be too high in winter, but it will depend on the water body that you survey. So volunteers are asked to attend a one, tra one day training session, and then they're given all the kit they need to go away and sample independently. Um, volunteers need to register a site, and they are asked to visit that site and collect a sample once a month. Um, so once you've got your site and your kit and you're ready to go, you um, head down to the, your site once a month, you do your three minute kick sample, and then you process it. And we're looking at these eight target groups of stoneflies, river fly, uh, stoneflies, mayflies, caddisflies, and shrimp. And once you've uh, processed your survey, data is submitted directly to the Riverfly Partnership through their website, and they've got a really easy form to do that. And it's aimed at being a user-friendly survey, and it can anyone can take part. Once they had run the uh, the basic army survey for a few years, they realised that um, it wasn't a case of one survey fits all rivers. So they developed the urban river fly scheme, and this is for urban areas, as the name suggests. And it is a survey that still looks at the eight groups that we've gone through tonight, but it also looks at an, at an additional six groups 
that um, are associated with high pollution tolerance. So these additional six groups are still quite easy to identify and they're um, common in lots of rivers, but they're particularly common in urban and, and modified rivers, um, which is why they're really good to look at. So again, the process is the same. Volunteers are expected to attend a one day training course. They're then given the kit. They choose their own site and they visit it monthly, submitting their data directly to the Riverfly Partnership. Again, the Urban Riverfly is a really, really uh, user friendly scheme and it's aimed at people everywhere. Once you've spent some time getting used to the basic scheme or the urban scheme, they have recently launched an extended Riverfly scheme. So this is for volunteers that have got some experience and are really keen to take it further. So the extended Riverfly course um, looks at the eight groups that we've gone through tonight, plus an additional 18 groups of Riverfly associated with high pollution tolerance. And these 18 groups have been chosen because they allow us to infer more about our river. So they're, they're more sensitive than some of the other groups and they can pick up um, issues such as sedimentation, changes in flow and changes in hydromorphology. The training course for extended river fly is longer. Um, I think it's two days in, in total. Um, but again, once you're trained, you get your kit, you select your site and you just visit monthly submitting your data online. Um, it is aimed to be accessible to everybody but it does help if you've got some of, of the other Riverfly experience before heading on to this. It's a little bit more technical. So if you want to get involved with Riverfly, many different organisations offer training sessions. So lots of conservation charities throughout the UK have partnered up with the Riverfly Partnership and um, act as hub sites for the Riverfly. So Seven Rivers Trust um, acts as a local hub site for Riverfly training. Um, and we tend to cover uh, Shropshire, Worcestershire, Gloucestershire, and we occasionally do stuff, some stuff in the Seven Uplands as well. Um, but there's many other organizations like us out there. So you, wherever you are in the UK, you can find someone to offer training. Um, so if you do want to get involved, the Unlocking the Seven website has a get involved section and you can go on there and register interest to become a Riverfly volunteer. We are planning to run some training courses this summer and to um, expand on what we do with Riverflies. So uh, you can head over there and register your interest. Um, if you are not local to the project, you can go onto the Riverfly Partnership website and on their contact us section, you can fill out a form and they will put you in touch with your local Riverfly hub. Brilliant, so that brings me um, to the end. If you've got any questions, please do pop them in the Q&A section. Any questions about Riverfly or about the Unlocking the Seven project and uh, thank you for listening. That was brilliant. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I found that really fascinating. I learned a lot. I can't believe how many different types of species of riverfly there are in, in the UK. It's amazing. These, these little things kind of getting on with their lives that we don't, you know, we don't even know are there. <laughs> I'll just um, give Rachel a few moments to catch up, uh, catch her breath and, and have a drink. Um, so I just wanted to say this talk is part of our seven series of talks. Um, we've got one more talk in the series which is happening next week which Rachel is also delivering and it's all about citizen science uh, taking place on the River Severn so please do sign up for that if you'd like to join us for that next week. Um, we've also been, been able to record most of the talks in the series and have uploaded them onto our YouTube channel so um, please do go and have a look at some of the previous talks, topics such as, well, there's an overview of the Unlocking the Seven project, if you'd like to know more about that. We had a talk about one of our fish passes, um, a Healthy Rivers panel last week, um, and another one all about some of the research on migratory fish that's happened on the River Seven as well. So before the end of the talk, I will post links to the in the chat to so you can find those recordings. Um, so I can see a few questions coming in. So Rachel, if you're ready, we'll, uh, we'll ask some questions. So 
first one we've had is uh, does the river fly scheme also run in Wales? Uh, yes it does so Seven Rivers Trust do um, offer some uh, training up there we've previously worked with uh, volunteers on the Cairn um, and we are planning to do some uh, more work in the future up there so yeah definitely please get in touch. Brilliant thank you. Um, Rebecca has also asked, uh, do you complement your river fly monitoring with any water sampling? Um, for this survey, we don't. So typically when um, volunteers get a, um, a result that indicates a severe change in water quality, that will be reported to their local ecological contact. Um, for, for our hub, that contact is usually somebody in the in the environment agency and if when we send our results to them they will then go out and do the follow-up water sampling um, there are some new citizen science schemes coming out at the moment where you can get um, basic water quality basic water sampling kits so some volunteers um, sign up for both schemes and when they go to do their river fly scheme they'll also do a water quality sample and that can be quite nice but for the river fly, we, we don't ask volunteers to do any water sampling. Brilliant, thank you. Um, another question here, um, is it possible for the public to see any of the data collected from the initiative? Um, all the data is open source. And if you go onto the river fly partnership website, it's available. The only bit I don't know is if you have to be registered on the website. Um, a lot of a lot of the website is is closed so that you need a login to access. Um, but certainly the data is available. So if if you did need a login to access it, you could just sign up on the Riverfly Partnership website. Okay, great. Um, Another question here is um, around the surveying. So um, what permission is required to survey? Um, and then sort of follow up, is it better to survey in the same places, even though the environments can change, uh, such as gravel shifting? Um, so in relation to permission to survey, typically we ask, um, whenever we're doing any sort of volunteer work, we always seek landowner permission first. Um, so it depends on your river fly hub. So some river fly hubs will um, already know who the landowner is and they may already have um, an agreement in place. But if you have a particular area in mind that you want to survey, um, you, it is best practice to go and ask for landowner permission. And if you don't know who the landowner is, then you can speak to your river fly hub coordinator and they'll be able to help with that. Um, the second part of that question, is it better to survey in the same place? Um, when, you, when you attend the training, they train you in site selection. So um, there's a, a process to selecting your site. There's a, it's a long form. And when you go to site, you fill out all the different criteria and that decides on what area in that site that you survey. And once you've registered, a, registered your site, it's really important to make sure you survey the same place each time. Brilliant. I have a question. Oh, I've had another one come in. So I will ask that one first and then save mine <laughs> for afterwards. Um, Rachel has asked when the best time to survey for river flies is. This depends on the species. So caddis flies, the best month for adult caddis flies is August. Uh, stoneflies, I think it is February. In terms of larvae, over winter, you're not going to see a lot because of the life cycle. Um, normally, we start in the water in April. Uh, the best months are summer months. So June, July, August, you're going to get your best data. And then uh, it starts tailing off again as we get into winter. Um, and that's also an important consideration when you look at the river fly data. So if you have a really high count in summer and then a low count in winter, 
it doesn't necessarily indicate um, a pollution event or a severe change in water quality. Uh, it can be part of the natural cycle of when river flies are present. And again, that will get covered in more detail in training so that you know what is an ecological natural uh, decline and what is a severe pollution decline. Brilliant. Thanks, Rachel. Um, my question was going to be, you mentioned a lot of the river flies don't feed when they're in their adult form. What do they feed on in their larval stage? Uh, do you know? And, and also what, what feeds on the river fly? So river flies feed on organic matter. And um, so they'll just be eating all the bits floating around in the water and um, all the like uh, algae and stuff off the, off the riverbed. Um, what feeds on river flies? It's probably quite a lot. So something pretty amazing that I wish I had a video to share with you is uh, the mayfly emergence. So when mayflies emerge, they emerge in their hundreds and you will see typically emergence is based on weather conditions. So it needs to be a certain temperature, a certain amount of sunlight, not too windy. Um, and the emergence is driven by environmental conditions. So when, when it's a good environmental condition for emergence, you'll see hundreds of mayflies just emerging from the surface of the water. And in some countries, the emergence is just so huge on such a large scale that they cover buildings, they cover cars, they cover roads, you can't see anything except mayflies. It's actually pretty spectacular. Um, and when this happens, the birds are feeding on them. At e in the evenings, the bats are feeding on them. Uh, larger insects will feed on them. They're quite an impressive food source as adults and as larvae. And if it seems to be with uh, aquatic invertebrates, if it's smaller than you, you eat it. <laughs> Anything and everything then. <laughs> Great. Um, a few more questions have, uh, have come in, uh, if that's okay, Rachel. Um, so Sue has asked if you could say a bit more about surveying the riverbank vegetation. How far do, um, do they travel up the bank? As in, is that how far we travel up the bank as a recorder or how far the river flies travel up the bank? Um, I would imagine maybe recorder, but maybe the river flies as well, if you know that. <laughs> so the river flies will go everywhere. Um, they'll just choose a spot where where they like. Um, for the recorder, it depends on the size of your your site. So if you've got a wide stream, you'll only be on one side. It's unlikely that you'd be crossed in a full stream. And if it's quite a shallow stream, you might use more vegetation. Um, but the, it's basically the most important thing about the survey is that it's timed. So it's a uh, timed effort survey so you've got three minutes so you've got three minutes for your kick sample and for sw sweep net in the vegetation so typically um people tend to do about two and a half minutes of kicking and then 30 seconds of sweeping but your site might not have any um bankside vegetation and i should say as well riverbank vegetation um can be the vegetation surrounding and it's not that it's that's not the vegetation that we sweep we sweep on the edge of the river so you're always in the water always sweeping in the water and you're sweeping that marginal vegetation right okay thank you thanks rachel um, i can see this question steph and i'm wondering if you're going to try and pronounce it <laughs> no I'm, I'm not going to uh pronounce it i will just stick to asking um uh, in the training, is there mention of invasive species? And yet there is a, a reference to a particular species. I don't know if you can pronounce that one. <laughs> Dichirogamorous, um, which is also known as the killer shrimp, which is the easiest way to do it. Um, <laughs> so yes, we do. We do cover um, invasive species. And when you attend a training, you also get an information pack to take home with you. And within that, it has the um, invasive species information sheets so that you know how to um, identify the common invasives that we see and where you can get more information. Um, with invasive species like the killer shrimp, they are a considerable size, so they're often quite easy um, 
to tell apart from our gamma shrimp. And typically when you come across an invasive species on a survey, we ask volunteers to take a, take a voucher specimen. Um, and that means that we can send it off and get confirmation that the invasive species is there. Great, thank you. Um, another question um, sort of regarding the surveying. Um, you've mentioned about using iRecord um, and sending a survey report in. Richard just wants you to clarify, does ARMY do the iRecord recording or does the surveyor submit that? So iRecord is used for adult records, but the ARMY scheme for the larval records go directly onto the ARMY website. So if you do a, a larval kick sample survey, you go onto the Riverfly Partnership website and submit your data there. If you go out and look for adults, um, or if, you, uh, if you're moth trapping in your garden and you get a caddis fly that you can ID, that record would go onto iRecord. Brilliant, thank you. Um, another question's come in asking, is biosecurity also mentioned in training, um, something that is important for reducing the risk of um, crayfish plague and other, other things? Yes, it is. So we, we cover biosecurity and we ask volunteers to follow the check, clean, dry process, uh, which is basically where after all your surveys, you check your equipment to make sure you haven't got any uh, vegetation stuck to it or any um, inverts left um, in your net or in any of your trays. And then when you get home, we ask you to clean them. Um, as a professional, when I clean my equipment, I use um, a substance called Vercon, which is a, like, a really strong disinfectant that kills off everything. But a more cost effective way of doing this is to leave your equipment out in the sun because the UV rays um, basically do the same thing, but it takes a bit longer. So typically when volunteers get home, we tell them to wash off their equipment and leave them outside in the garden for um, 48 hours, 72 if possible, that's more ideal. And then the sun does the work for them. Brilliant, thank you, Rachel. Um, I'll just double check, but I think that's all the questions that we've had in. I think we've answered everybody's questions. Yes, we have. <laughs> oh, hang on, another one's just popped up. <laughs> um, and what's the technique for washing between sample sites? Um, Rebecca has asked. Um, so typically, most of our volunteers will have one site. If you were going to multiple sites on one day, we would ask you to um, either have two sets of equipment or to use Vercon. Vercon's really the only um, thing we can use to be guaranteed that we're not tra traveling um, anything from one site to another. So if I'm out doing a survey for work, I've always got Vercon with me and all my kit gets washed. Um, but typically best practice is to have uh, multiple kits. So we do that if possible. But generally our Riverfly surveyors aren't going to multiple sites. Um, it can take quite a long time to process your sample, especially if you've got a really good bit of stream and most people would not go to two on the same day. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Rachel. So that's it for the questions for now. Um, if you do have any more, feel free to, to pop them in, any last minute ones whilst I go through the sort of um, closing bits of the talk. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Rachel. It's been a really informative talk and I can see a few comments coming in as well, people agreeing that, that it's been great and, and that they've learned a lot. So thank you very much. Um, and thank you to Laura for, for signing all of that for us as well. Um, I have popped a link to a survey in the chat box um, just about the event. So if you um, do have a few minutes to tell us about your experience this evening, we would be really grateful for, for any feedback that you have. Um, I'll be emailing this out to everybody as well. So don't worry if you haven't got time to do that now. Um, so as I mentioned, this talk was part of our seven series of online webinars 
which were all about exploring the life beneath the surface of the seven. So um, we do have one final talk, as I mentioned next week, which Rachel will be delivering again. Um, she'll be sharing some of the other ways that you can get involved in volunteering for the Unlocking the Seven project, both online or in person. Um, so please come along if you would like to play a part in some of the scientific research happening on the river. We're gearing up for a really exciting time with the shad returning to the river, um, making their way upstream um, as they do each, each kind of April, May. So a really great time to get involved if you would like to join us um, on the project. All of the previous talks, as I've said, can be found on the Unlocking the Seven YouTube channel. And I will post a link now into the chat box, which takes you to our website, which has some more details about those talks um, and links to those recordings as well, if you want to catch up on any of those. Um, so if, you, if you'd like to learn anything more about Unlocking the Seven or our volunteering opportunities, um, events that we have coming up, schools outreach that we're doing as well, please head to our website, which is unlockingthe7.co.uk for more information on those. Um, and if you would like to keep up to date with what we're doing, um, as I said, it's an exciting few months coming up for us, then please sign up to our newsletter on our website or you can find us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram as well using the handle at 7unlocked. So yeah, really hope you've enjoyed this evening's talk. A few other comments coming in saying thanks to Rachel, which is great. Um, no more questions have come through um, there. So just to say thanks again to Rachel for this evening and to Laura for signing along. Um, I'll give it a few moments so you can just um, follow those links that I've posted in the chat box and I will add um, one more in there with a link to our website. There we go, if you did want to go on there and find out any more information. Um, and hopefully we might see some of you soon, uh, yeah, either, either sampling Riverfly with us or um, volunteering in another way or joining us for, for some of our events. We'd love, to, we'd love to see you by the river. Okay, brilliant. Well, we will leave it there. Thanks again for joining us this evening and um, yeah, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks Thank very you. much, everyone. Bye. Bye.